Welcome to World Builders Anonymous. Kick that world building addiction and actually finish that novel with your hosts, Vito and John. Your waveforms are always so small when you send them to me. You have plenty of game, but it's just the waveforms visually don't look very big. It's weird. I have little baby waveforms. Little baby waves. I've been known for that. <laughs> Johnny, trademark. Johnny Baby Waves Gatilla is what they call you. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> Got me a zero calorie cream soda. Oh, nice. Mm. What, what is it sweetened with? Stevia. Ooh, ooh, fancy schmancy. Nice. The well, best, I guess we all know what that means. That means welcome to the podcast, everyone. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I have a special <laughs> intro for today. Here we go. Oh, it fell, all fell apart. Oh, oh so close. A, I almost made it's it. A, it's a very, what is that on? I have a tiny pink toy guitar in, in my bedroom for, for, <laughs> from something. And I always, I always serenade Lydia to bed with it. But uh, oh. today I decided I would serenade you into the podcast with it. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. You've been serenaded by a tiny pink guitar. Hope I you're happy. I was very impressed by my opening there. That was actually quite difficult to play on this thing. I mean, I couldn't do it, so... <laughs> Nice. <laughs> anyway, welcome You're saying back. nice to yourself. I know. I'm <laughs> you do myself, something literally nice. Myself on the back right now. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so cool. I'm Look so at me. cool playing my tiny pink guitar. Yes. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to the podcast after another great week of writing and uh, getting back to whoop, whoop. it. Yeah, we are going to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, I think we talked a little bit beforehand. We're going to talk mainly about um, some things we haven't quite uh, discovered yet in our stories, and that's our antagonists today Womp. it's kind of the, the unofficial topic for today first let's do just a quick a quick update on uh how things went this week um yep. i'll go i'll go first this time just because you know i did such a great job playing my tiny pink guitar oh yeah you deserve it i, I really do <laughs> anyway um to this, this week it was actually quite good i um kind of um figured out um I, a little bit of a change in the first chapter that's gonna kind of help set things up Going forward, um, it was um, kind of holding me up for a day or two um, until I figured out what to do. I basically changed um, whether a character is um, – com- he's, he's coming home in the beginning from from the siege at this city. And I, I originally had it that he was uh, conscripted and then he, like, deserted to go back home. Now mm-hmm. I have it that he's, like, on leave going back home. Because if he deserted, like, he'd be just kind of hanging around and having to hide and you know, he couldn't really do much of anything. And at this – first stage of the book i really want to introduce the world and uh, if he's inside doing nothing it's really hard to kind of introduce you to uh, the town he comes from and all the people that are going to be important later on um and so that that small change just like really uh, helped set things up for every all the ideas i wanted to do going forward but i couldn't because i'd kind of written myself into a corner a little bit Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was good and um yeah uh, small changes like that can can really make a big difference Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned you didn't have a ton of time this week. Did you get, get anything uh, kind of uh, out this week? I did, yeah. I got probably about, I don't know, between a third and a half of the next chapter going. Um, but mostly just business as usual, as it kind of has been, been with this. Yeah, yeah. A lot more productive writing sessions. Um, they don't have to be quite as long, I find. And the, what's what's been fun is kind of when you arrive at the end of a chapter, you're allowed to kind of just project forward in your mind about what might happen next and then just jump in. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. So uh, just, just, a, just the normal for me, um, just pushing through, uh, but just a, a bit of time restrictions this week. Yeah, totally. I was just happy that I got kind of past this roadblock. Cause the thing I, I always have been scared about in discovery writing and why I haven't really done it much before is that I always just assumed that this would happen all the time. They would write yourself mm-hmm. into a corner and be like, Oh crap. Well now what do I do? I'm going to change all right. this stuff going back and all this kind of thing. And I actually, decided not to go back and actually change the words I'd written in the beginning yet. I just kind of made a yeah. note of like what the change needed to be and then kept going with the Push idea on, yeah. because I, I might lose the momentum if I went back and like changed it then because it's frustrating to go back and like delete a bunch of stuff and rewrite it or, uh, or, or like go line by line to the, like the actual lines where they mention something where you didn't have to change it. Um, yeah, right. It's just a pain in the butt and something that to do in, in sort of a non-creative writing session, maybe like more of an editing session, I think. Um, unless you're into it, maybe, you know, if that's a way you want to sort of stimulate the ideas for this new idea, um, that's fine too, I guess. But that wasn't the case. So anyway, yeah, it worked out really well. 
But yeah, today we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something I've got a bit of already um, in mind, but uh, you're still kind of discovering and, and thinking about. Yeah, I've got like um, a, a shadow of a potential for what it might look like, but I don't really know yet. A shadow of a potential. Ooh, mm. deep. Nice. That'll be the name of the villain. Yeah, <laughs> the sh- a shadow of the potential. It's going to be it's a perfect. mouthful whenever anyone references him, her, don't it, worry about it. other. Don't whatever. worry about it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we thought we might even do like a quick um, kind of uh, on-air uh, brainstorm. Uh, not that we'd figure out exactly what your antagonist is going to be right, today, right. but just kind of in, in brainstorming, kind of coming up with ideas, maybe talk about the different aspects one should probably consider when um, when making their uh, antagonist. And, and maybe even making them is, is almost a, a bit of a misnomer because... It, it, just like the rest of this process, I feel like we're going to be more discovering them. And and, if, and for you in particular, you have such a clear idea of your protagonist and kind of their journey and their goal. Um, it, this might be more of a case where you tailor the antagonist to fit the protagonist, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Wait, not, it, it, maybe that would lead you too much towards making them... I don't know, two dimensional and kind of just a foil for the protagonist. Right. Um, but but too often, I think it's almost the other way around, where the protagonist just feels like they're reacting to whatever the antagonist is doing. Sure. And they become the more passive character, whereas the the antagonist is the one, um, you know, accomplishing things, and he's got the goal, and he's working towards it, and he's like, you know, accomplishing that goal, and that almost makes him more, more identifiable sometimes. Um, yeah. Which is something to avoid, unless that's what you're going for, I guess. All this is, you know, <laughs> to avoid unless you're going for it. Be intentional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. It makes sense. But yeah, but there's different kinds of antagonists too. Like there's the kinds that are these almost forces outside of anyone's control, whether that's nature in maybe like a disaster movie or something like that, or, right. uh, you know, this great evil empire, maybe personified in, you know, something like Emperor Palpatine, I guess. Um, and there can be layers too, like in Star Wars, you know, Darth Vader is of course the more proximal, um, antagonist to the protagonists, but you know, ultimately he's not the main bad guy. He's yeah, kind of right. doing the will of this other person and eventually kind of, um, uh, breaks ties with them and, uh, becomes more sympathetic later on. That's something to do too. Um, what, any ideas that you've had so far for your story? Maybe you can even, um, Talk a little bit about what your, I guess, trajectory is right now. Maybe that'll give us more context. Sure. So essentially the book is going to open on uh, the main character's name is Darren. And he's a part of this this crew of people doing some business that's not necessarily entirely legal, but it's not like they're killing anyone or hurting anyone. Victimless um, crimes. Victim, for, yeah, victimless crimes. Um, now there's the 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 front of what they're trying to do, which is essentially salvage diving for... Um, By the way, I've got the, when it comes out sorry. later that I also have salvage diving in my story, I want it to be known that we actually completely entirely up, independently compi- came up entirely with independently the, came up with salvage diving, which is insane. I think <laughs> it's the, the best thing are. ever. Yeah, both of our antagonists are involved in salvage diving for some reason, and have had that idea of doing that for some time. Yeah, like for a long time, like completely yeah. independent of each other. So that's just a weird. Before part. we even start talking about writing books yeah. together or anything, it was, it's weird. But um, <laughs> so. I'm thinking that in this world, there's, I think I have to zoom out a little bit. There's a sort of, uh, it's super creative, uh, there's a empire of sorts that's kind of taken over control of a, a, a series of smaller territories that used to be independent, and now they're united, quote unquote, under this sort of grand imperial whatever. Details, <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't important right now. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, uh, they have a lot of rules and restrictions in place, and one of them is essentially that when a imperial ship goes down for any reason, you can't just go and salvage it. They have, they're the ones who are going to take care of it. They're going to you know, get their own boats and go take care of stuff. Um, however, our crew of fancy lads uh, doesn't really <laughs> like to live up to those uh, restrictions because they want to find the good stuff. I'm just uh, imagining so, them all like these dandies with like jaunty feathers in their caps and stuff. And monocles. Just like, just like, you know, bouncing around the ship so joyously, you know. What ho, lads? What let's ho? go find some salvage. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they, again, it's all very preliminary. Um, but they will swoop in when they hear, you know, get word of uh, an Imperial ship going down. They'll try to get there before um, Imperial, you know, salvagers or whatever, what have you. 
uh, come in. And the the idea that most of the crew has, including our main character, Darren, is that they're just diving for, um, you know, whatever valuables they can find. But the captain of the crew uh, kind of believes this, this myth that there are um, these magical stones that the Empire has control of that give them... Uh, powers that they claim are from their deity uh, and they sort of claim a monopoly over their 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 religion uh, through the use of these stones they say they're the ones who are blessed by the gods and it's their divine right to rule or whatever uh, and it's because they have these magical artifacts and the captain is some, kind of superstitious and believes that i guess anti-superstitious maybe he's a you know something of a realist um, and he thinks that there are artifacts that are giving them these powers and he thinks that if he can find one he can kind of break the power of the empire. So he's kind of a, a rebel in that regard. And he might even have ties to some sort of rebel organization. So anyway, um, they, but they get caught at some point. Uh, the empire gets onto the fact that the captain has one of these stones uh, and they come and they raid the boat. And our main character is, has this, this magical stone that carries the weight of the ability to break this empire, essentially. Uh, thrust into his hands without knowing what it is, and he gets tossed overboard by the captain who wants to keep the stone away from the Imperials. And, like, shouts after him to find somebody to get Yeah, to. find so-and-so, find some associate of his in the city. He'll know what to do. Um, and then that's, like, the beginning of the book. And then, you know, the, the a good portion of the book is the main character trying to figure out what's going on because uh, he's kind of thrust into this um, this role of having to save his, his friends, his, his crewmates, uh, but not understanding what the stone is, who the guy is looking for is, where he is, you know, he doesn't know anything. Um, so the motivation of the main character primarily, at least on the outset of the story, is purely a personal goal, which is to save his friends, um, to find whoever, you know, he's supposed to find um, who, you know, in his mind will be able to help. And by finding him will save his, his friends. So that being the main goal of the main character leads me to kind of think the villain of the story. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a kind of thing like you're talking about with um, you know, the villain is essentially the structure of the empire, right? It's, it's the overarching, you know, as far bad as, as, far as Darren knows plot. at this point, yeah. Right, but there needs to be a person for whom or for him, to him. Wow, man, <laughs> this is a complicated little web of words. Um, there needs to be a, a representative of that that becomes a goal for him to overcome. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, totally. Um, so like in, in, in The Phantom Menace, you know, it's kind of Darth Maul is the you know the immediate threat that they're trying to beat. Are, right? we, are we holding up Phantom Menace as an example to emulate here? It's a plot. It's not. I don't. Have, I'm not talking about how good the movies are. <laughs> I see what you mean. Jeez. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean though, with Darth Maul. Don't be a snob. <laughs> but yeah, so I need. But I don't know what role I want that that person to play. I don't know if I want it to be a higher up, you know, some kind of, you know, grand inquisitor whose job it is to like exert control over the people. I don't know if it's going to be a more. Um, like a low for maybe if this is going to be a series, maybe you want the first sort of boss quote unquote to be some sort of local magistrate of some kind who, you know, is exerting control over the specific city that Darren is in. And he's kind of on to what I don't, like, so let's say that the guy Darren's trying to find is the rebel, you know, leader of the area. Uh, and, and that's why the captain wanted him to go to him. Um, what if that guy knows about the rebellion going on and he's, you know, actively trying to squash it? Maybe that makes him the primary antagonist of the first book, which is more localized to this one area. And then the story branches out beyond that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it is important to to have tears like that. Not like tears you cry, but like like wedding cake tears levels. So sad. <laughs> so sad. Um, that uh, you kind of ramp up over time, especially if you're doing a, a series like that. Because um, uh, it's, it's going to be easy to just kind of get excited and, and be like, oh, the Grand Inquisitor of the entire Empire is looking for him right, right now. Right. And then once you defeat him, like, okay, now what? <laughs> Here's a better example. Aragon, right? In the first book. He's not trying to actively, you know, thwart Galvatorix. He's fighting Durza. That's the, you know, the enemy that he's trying to overcome 
in the first book, and he uh, he you know, accomplishes that. But he hasn't really done too much large scale because the big bad guy is still there, you know. Yeah, totally. I, I would, <clears throat> I'd be careful though to avoid like having like the the main villain, like the emperor of the empire or whatever, to have like one main minion that he sends out and like once sure, you overcome yeah, that right. minion, like well now I guess I have to do it myself. Here we go. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll take him on one on one. <laughs> I, I rather I, I like what you were saying before, and, and this is kind of what I'm I'm going for in my story right now. Um, like think local like who 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 knows Darren has this stone right now who is likely to impose obstacles to him in his day-to-day kind of dealings with this initial situation he finds himself in um, who's going to give him op- opposition and why in the goal that he's currently you know going towards um, right. and kind of ramp up from there um, rather than having like the the uh, I don't know like the Durza character I guess um, to, uh, who, who is uh, somehow knows where he is already and uh, is is the main person giving him grief in this situation. Right. You know, it could be if like, you're trying to go for something realistic, you you would you know the big bad guy wouldn't go out and deal with every little problem by himself, and yeah. he wouldn't send his right hand man to do it either. He'd be like, oh, who's in the area? You know, who's oh, controlling that area? We'll have them do it. Yeah, I mean, unless it, until it becomes a big enough deal to do that, like, and you can only you only really know at this point how big of a deal that the the empire, whatever it is, thinks um, the fact that this stone is missing is. But um, likely they would have you know local people sort of alerted to the fact that they need to be on the lookout for this thing, and they would be the ones on the ground actually like you know doing stuff to actively look for it and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and you, you already have like a, a, a smaller <laughs> kind of antagonist um, that is actually going to become an ally, I think, at some point. Right, right. Um, as well. Yeah, it breaks down. Yeah, it's it's fun because um, I think a fun way to introduce kind of side characters and friends is, is to kind of, you know, bring them in over time, you know, over a small amount of time. But in this case... Um, he starts out as someone who's who's thwarting Darren in in a small way. Um, you know, there's a I don't want I don't know if I want to even spoil what that actually looks like, but <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, funny. It, I think it's pretty fun, but um, yeah, I, I'm bringing in you know a character who who in the very short term makes Darren's life a lot harder without really even knowing what he's doing. Um, but you know they kind of click and connect and become friends. Um, I, I like after when, it. Yeah, I like when allies are kind of introduced through conflict. It can be a, a fun way to introduce them and also kind of to give them an immediate obstacle to overcome. And after they do, it really creates that bond between them in the reader's mind. I think a lot more than if they just kind of like, "Hey, I like you. You like me. Let's travel together." Okay, cool. I like killing zombies. Right. Oh, I like killing zombies too. Oh, yeah. What a coincidence, you know? Yeah, it kind of <laughs> avoids the whole like, "Oh, you walked into a city and met your new best friend, and now you're you know a team. Cool, perfect." <laughs> Yeah, Uh, (laughs) that was convenient, wasn't it? Yeah, you don't want things to seem too easy or convenient. Yeah, Uh, even if things work out, you know, very conveniently in the end, I think it it needs to come with some trouble for for the character to overcome. You know, always. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. But Um, that's like the lowest level of you know, quote unquote, antagonist in the story is, you know, someone who essentially is a minor inconvenience just because he's a little jerk. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And Um, I, I I really like the idea of keeping, if you have like an overarching kind of. And we keep saying empire. That's very much a placeholder, I know. Um, and it sure. kind of is for me, too. Although, because I'm still kind of somewhat basing my setting on historical events, I have a, probably a more clear idea of the yeah. kind of political structure that's that's kind of in place. Um, but whenever we say empire, don't get the impression that we're actually going to name our overarching kind the of... The empire. Yeah, power the empire. Because We are a creative bit, people. That's a little bit overdone. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it, it'd be cool to like leave them out of it even completely as long as you can, you know. Um, oh have... yeah, like Darren isn't aware of like the the you know political upheaval that's happening, or like he doesn't know what's going on in that regard. Yeah, he's, he's just trying simple, to save his friends, and he's a simple cabin boy on a on a you know uh, basically an illegal uh, salvage ship. Salvage, he's not like yeah. he's this connected, educated, you know, well informed right, right. person. Like he might hear things. And that's an important point to to put in there too. Like you have to. I, again, every story is unique, and and you know you, you play this by ear, but you don't want your character to just know everything that's going on all the time, um, especially when it involves things that are you know like 
the inner workings of the empire and who the right hand man to the you know the emperor himself is and like oh i see him in the street no he's there there right yeah. um i recognize, I recognize him yeah. <laughs> you know what he looks like <laughs> you know that, that kind of thing kind of happens sometimes or like you happen to have someone with you who met the emperor once and like oh the emperor's over there why is he doing here you know yeah totally you, know, you want to avoid some of that and i think it ties directly into um something else that's really important especially in the beginning of a story i think um the 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 plot shouldn't immediately be important to the character just because it's the plot of the story, if you know what I mean. Like these stones yes. and kind of this imp- this like political struggle and all that kind of thing isn't necessarily that important to the main character right off the bat. Like sure, it sh- they should. He just wants to save his friends, right? Because it's not important to the reader off the bat because they're just being introduced to this world. So if it becomes important for specific reasons through the course of the first little bit of the story, that not only solidifies the character but it also kind of gives the reader themselves kind of brings them along for the ride with the main character as to why this is important why they should care about it um so i think starting out with the immediate sort of um uh day-to-day kind of moment-to-moment struggles that he's immediately going through is a great way to solidify the character and as he uh, teases out more of why these things are happening and why they're affecting him um and how he can overcome them that's going to sort of ramp up the bad guy i guess as it were um, and you, you've talked before about making the antagonist a point of view character even. Is that still something you're right. thinking about doing? I've been really thinking about it. And, and, and one large reason is this. So, like I said, Darren's friends – I actually don't think I mentioned this specifically. But when Darren's pushed overboard with the stone, um, his friends are all either captured or killed. So I think a few of them are probably killed. But most of them are captured to be interrogated because they know that – Someone in that crew had, I think the captain, they probably know the captain had it, but they know they had the stone and now they don't. So they need to talk to them and interrogate them and find out where it is, right? Right. So and they take them. Yeah, oh, go ahead. No, uh, I was just going to say, it, uh, well, I, I'm, I'll save it for later. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to make sure that I don't let the reader forget the stakes. Um, what's, what's at play here with Darren trying to find them? I need them to know that they're not exactly, you know, in a good place and they're being tortured and they're being, you know, all, all a bunch of bad stuff is happening to them while while Darren's trying to find a way to help them. Um, and I don't know exactly know how to do that other than providing a viewport into their world where they are right now. So I was wondering, or I guess I was thinking about having if you know, whatever local level villain I have, maybe he's a perspective character and he's the one interrogating the crew and so we see him and his struggles and his you know his outlook on this whole thing um and we maintain the view of you know darren's friends and the predicament they're in um another way of playing it is you know have a perspective that's in that area but it might not be the main villain maybe it's just the torturer right the you know whoever is the you know the local government's you know torture guy and maybe he has a lot of you know, hesitations about what he's doing because he doesn't really trust the the local government, but he, they're paying him. So until he sees something that's worthwhile in order to, you know, stop doing it, he's just doing his job. But maybe through the events of the story, he kind of comes to their side and becomes an ally for Darren and his friends uh, later on down the road. I just don't exactly know how to play all that while maintaining uh, a view and a, a reminder to the reader that Darren's friends are in a bad situation. Totally. I, I really like the idea of a uh, executioner or torturer who is often the same person, um, who is a point of view character. There's a book called the blade itself by Joe Abercrombie, uh, Abercrombie yep. that, uh, we both have read a bit of. And, um, I think I've read the whole thing. You haven't read the whole thing. Have you? I didn't finish it yet. Okay, cool. Um, but there's a, uh, a character named Glockta in that book that is a, uh, a, a torturer, essentially. He's like an inquisitor. Um, and he does these horrible things to people, but he's a sympathetic character because he's, you know, got this backstory and, you know, they, they, he does a good job of writing him in a sympathetic way, even though he's this awful person who does awful things. Um, it's really interesting, and that can lead to some really interesting characters for sure. Um, I, like, I like that idea a lot. Another thing you could do is have, I mean, how did, um, in, in cases like this where there's like a, a betrayal or something, or, you know, they found out about the thing you have and they came to get it and that kind of stuff, oftentimes there should be some reason 
that should be explained why they found out that you had the thing. Uh, right. In this case, the rock. Maybe that was a mole in the crew, even, and maybe that could be an interesting point of view character oh, yeah, who's, sure. who's doing things for his own reasons that might be very sympathetic, but they're working, you know, completely 180 degrees opposite what the protagonist is working towards. Right. Even and though that can be neither one of revealed. them is a bad guy necessarily, but they have opposite goals. Um, right. And that can be interesting too. <clears throat> and you can reveal that through. If the torturer is a, a prospective character, you get a glimpse into that world and you can kind of slowly reveal that kind of thing as the story progresses. Yeah, kind of he, he calls another person into the torture room to interrogate them and like kind of pretends to be all mad. And once they get in the room, he's just like, OK, cool. So uh, they, they, they start you know cons- conspiring or whatever. Uh, right. And you're like, right, oh, right. man, what happened? Uh, even the, the kind of the crew member could be the point of view character. You never know. Um, uh, anything like that could be cool, yeah. Sort of a, a double agent almost, because it's good to have characters that are you know run the gamut between like Emperor Palpatine, just pure evil, just acting <laughs> for maniacal purposes exclusively, right? To Darth Vader, who's you know sympathetic because he's you know had all this bad stuff happen to him, and he's really trying to you know turn at the end and that kind of stuff. But he's also pretty pure evil <laughs> to characters like that who are. Not bad guys, almost like an anti-hero, um, or I guess what's the opposite? What's like a uh, almost a bad guy who's really identifiable? Um, and golem, kinda, maybe? Yeah, like a golem who's who's working towards their own ends and aren't really a you know what you'd call a good guy, but they're very sympathetic characters and that you can really get into their shoes and, and understand why they are the way they are, and it's kind of tragic that way. Um, yeah, it, it's good to have like a, several different flavors of, of bad guy, I guess, <laughs> at different levels of, you know, um, giving the protagonist grief, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do there. Um, I, li- I like the idea of having a, a mole in the crew. That's a, I like that idea a lot. Right, because it, it, it kind of just flows from the fact that, oh, well, this thing happens. You know, there's a raid on the ship, and you kind of ask the question, well, how did they know that the guy had the stone? Well, somebody must have told them. Uh, you couldn't just know that uh, out of nowhere. Um, then maybe there's somebody in the crew who snitched on them. Well, why did they do that? Oh, well, I guess, you know, maybe there's some reason they had for doing it. And you kind of ask questions, and the answers lead you to more questions, and that's kind of how you discover this sort of thing, I guess, that, which is what I'm finding yeah, right. with, uh, with my story so far. It's just a series of questions and answers, really. Right. And you, you know, don't make some attempt to put it all in some kind of order that makes you know, some sort of sense. Yeah. And, and I, I guess one of the dangers is not, asking enough questions at the beginning i'm just kind of this is just kind of occurring to me um right but if uh, if for example you had continued writing you know writing 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 and gotten a long way in and then kind of asked yourself well wait how did how did they know that they had the stone in the first place that could lead you to answers that contradict what you've already done and that's when things probably get frustrating so i I think in the beginning it's probably important to really ask yourself a lot of questions about all different aspects of what you're currently working on um kind of look at it from different angles you know try to find out what's going on in your own head before you kind of go on this path long enough to where it's you're not going to want to go you're not going to want to go back even if you could go back and correct it it's really demoralizing to realize oh man i have to delete like three whole chapters here and like rewrite all this stuff and this plot point can't even happen now and and I imagine that's when things get really tough for a discovery writer. So just kind of being vigilant, and especially in the first part of writing something like this uh, with the discovery writing thing, it's probably pretty important. Right, being careful to put all the pieces into into the right place before you, you know. Yeah, and just make sure and make sure the decisions you're making, the paths you're deciding to go down, are the ones you really want to go down. Um, kind of like what I did this week. Um, I had the the, the the decision to have the main character kind of coming back <clears throat> from this war as a deserter because I thought that was interesting. Um, but that led me to kind of a, a range of choices available to me that I didn't really want to choose from. None, none of them su- seemed interesting. I wanted to choose this other one. Um, but I had to change that initial decision I had made. Um, so, yeah, it's just good to kind of question the decision, decisions you've made and ask the questions that those decisions bring up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I like the I like the kind of direction we're we're on with the my villain in there. There's a lot of a lot of different elements at play that you can Yeah, and it sounds exploit. like and, and it's mainly for the more proximal villain, I guess, quote unquote villain. Sure, uh, yeah. So far, um there can be like we well, said Well, ultimately many that's what's more important. Yeah, especially for right now. The sake of the story uh at at the current state, it's, you know, we need to have a 
an antagonist that feels like an immediate threat to to Darren and something that's tangible, not like, you know, obviously he his mission is ultimately at odds with, you know, the head of the Empire himself. Um, but that's not the, the immediate threat that Darren faces. His immediate threat is the people who are being sent after him to try to find him to bring him in, to retrieve the stone, you know, what have you. Those are the things that he needs to care about uh, you know, on a personal level uh, in order for the, the threat to feel real. Totally, yeah. And you as the writer just need to think about, you know, who has an incentive to stop the main character from achieving his goal? How would they do that? Um, kind of what what if they get from it? Uh, what have they been doing before now is kind of a good question probably um like what sure. what what is this interrupting for them this this new goal of of getting in the protagonist's way what did that interrupt what were they doing before what is their previous goal like, right. what, what do they care about you know before this um, like the the idea that comes to mind for me is you know the emperor comes down and says you know to the local not the emperor i'm emperor himself but like he sends someone to tell the local leader um hey this this happened we we arrested these people off the shore they were supposed to have this stone but they didn't uh we have reason to suspect that it's you know pot- potentially somewhere in the city we need you to help us find it and you know that local leader happens to be you know someone who's under feels underappreciated is you know his political career is kind of stagnated he's trying to make a name for himself and you know get promoted to a you know a governor of a region instead of just a local city leader um and so he really bites on this this idea of finding the stone as well because he his career wants to demonstrate this, his yeah. his his you know his moxie as a leader. So then when when Darren you know resists him, it becomes personal for him as well because he has things at stake too. Maybe his wife's not happy with him because he's such a such a slacker and he's still just this local you know bureaucrat and and he's just like really motivated to you know make things happen for himself and he's really trying his best and you can play that in a lot of ways too maybe he's so focused on that that he's kind of lost sight of what the emperor empire is doing maybe they're doing some terrible things that he's kind of turning a blind eye to because of his ambition and, and maybe the the mirror gets turned around at some point and he you know might even join the rebels at some point yeah that's, you, know, you that's, can do a lot of different things yeah that's an interesting topic of why people do bad things like that and join causes that are so obviously evil i mean there's a lot of literature on that obviously that goes way beyond the scope of oh, our sure. simple little podcast but uh there's a lot of interesting stuff there you can read uh read about for sure um ways to make characters not necessarily sympathetic but y- y- there's a lot that it, understandable yeah there's a lot in our common humanity that you know kind of uh, explains why people could do that and i think pretty much anybody is capable of evil under the right circumstances um and i think it's it's definitely something to to read up on and kind of, you know, <laughs> incorporate into your bad guys, I guess, or, you know, your... Oh, for sure. Especially, especially people like that who are kind of these lower level, um, just kind of not so, not so important people who just kind of are going along with it, you know, for various reasons of their own. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's definitely something important to consider as well. Um, yeah. Anything else you were thinking of? No, I, I think we kind of got to a good place there. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Um, kind of a impromptu sort of brainstorm slash analysis of you know what to think about when you're discovery writing antagonists. I guess yeah. Um, like everything else we're doing right now, this is kind of new territory, but uh, yeah, it's going going super well so far, and um, I'm really excited about it, continuing with it. Yeah, I'm enjoying my story more than I was before. I'm enjoying thinking about it more, and enjoying you know approaching writing uh, is a lot more fun. Yeah, me too. Um, definitely some new challenges to overcome, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely much more fulfilling than it's felt in a long time for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any uh, announcements you want to make? Any uh, uh, social media plugs? Uh, sure. We'll do some plugs. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at World Builders Anonymous. You can find us on, uh, or you can email us at wbapodcast at gmail dot com. Find us on Reddit at WBA underscore podcast, and uh, someone actually sent me a message on Reddit recently. So pe- you can message us there, and you can find us. So, Vito, you haven't been entirely wrong, I'm, maybe. I'm learning all kinds of new things about Reddit. Oh, you're, you're learning. Your brain is three times its previous size. <laughs> um, find our website, www.worldbuildersanonymous.com. You can find all the podcast episodes there, as well as some you know information about us, and you can find some articles we've written. 
and that's no, there's a couple other things there. You can find out for yourself. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, leave us an iTunes review if you like the podcast. If not, still leave us a review. It, it uh, <laughs> doesn't cost you anything, and it helps us out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> do this, and if you don't want to, do it anyway. Thank anyway. you. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh, it's ugly. Kill it now. <laughs> <laughs> this show is sponsored in part by Audible. Visit worldbuildersanonymous.com slash audible to check out what the guys are listening to right now and to receive a free audiobook.